Greetings again. Thank you for those presentations. I'll be uh, reading what Professor Ray St. Jacques has to say about your presentations and looking forward to, uh, to seeing more of this. We're going to do this in one form or another, presentations every class. Uh, a few words about the course. Uh, I believe you know the details in rough by now, but three classes, the third class, you miss three classes and you're done, you're out. It's absolutely imperative that you attend. You can produce a medical certificate, supporting documentation like that for emergencies, but for the next six weeks, Tuesdays and Thursdays in the morning, you belong here, 8.30 to 11.30, which is rough, I know, but that's the nature of the beast. Uh, this is the priority. I'm not going to accept excuses about work or about what your boss had or about the meeting or about the whatever. It, it, that will count against one of your three. So keep that in mind. If you're not able to commit to this class, drop it now because uh, I have no patience with students that don't put the effort in to show up. Showing up is the number one, number one course to success in school and in life and too many students are not showing up, too many students are not reading uh, and too many students are not giving a damn about their education, which is extraordinary. Speaking of extraordinary, the uh, debate that's taking place on the nature of capitalism right now, we see it. We see it in the rise of the, the uh, Occupy movement. It's not a new debate. It's a debate that's been going on for over a century and more about the nature of capitalism. It's a very curious time when we see magazines like uh, Foreign Affairs, which is a conservative magazine by any measure, have on its title Capitalism and Inequality. And Foreign Affairs addresses the issue uh, by saying, yes, there is considerable inequality out there, extraordinary inequality. In fact, one of the, uh, the, one of the clearest, most indisputable financial realities, facts of the situation is that over the past 30 years, since the time of, of Reagan and Thatcher and the neoliberalization of the economy, that's deregulation that occurred in the 1980s, but particularly over the past 30, 40 years, the rich have gotten considerably richer. Uh, CEO pay scales, for example, have gone from uh, 1 to 20 ratios to 1 to 3 and 2 and 300 making two and three hundred times what the average worker uh, makes. And we accept that as normal. We accept this vast gulf as normal, justified. You must be aware, and if you aren't, heaven help you, that uh, the world's been going through a bit of a recession, that European states and America are, in particular, going through uh, repeated recessions, with the uh, mortgage crisis, the financial crisis, and so on. And the response to that has been among the, among the elite, the plutocrats as they're called, governing elite, they've instituted measures in Ireland and in Greece and various other states, austerity measures. Britain's following that path as well. The idea of decreasing government spending to fix the economy. And there is an interesting article in the New York Times today by Paul Krugman. He talks about the failure of this austerity theory, the science behind it's proven flawed, the economic theory is, is in shambles, and it's a it's a bit of a joke when it comes down to the actual numbers of it, but the details aren't as important as, the, uh, as what the theory represents. So the theory represents, Krugman says, an imposition of elite beliefs upon policy. The, the elite believe, let me get it from his mouth, I have to ask, what are the policy preferences between the difference in policy preferences 
let me put it this way, sorry, there's a difference in policy preferences when it comes to economic actions between the middle class and the elite. The middle class see deficit as being a problem, but only one of many problems. The elite see deficit as being the problem, the single biggest problem, and the elite believe that the solution to this economic trouble that we're in is to decrease spending on social welfare, decrease spending on health care, decrease spending on pensions and retirement. The middle class and lower classes believe just the opposite, to increase those spendings on the entitlement programs, on the social system. Now, the funny thing, and Krugman points this out, this, is, this brings us into the realm of ideology and economic thinking, is that the austerity theory fits with the elite belief that governments need to spend less to increase the economy and governments need to spend less in particular on things that are of concern to the middle class and the lower classes. The elite don't have to worry about health care, the elite don't have to worry about retirement, they're taken care of. So they don't care to see money being spent on things that they don't need. And that's the type of money they want to take out of the system. Krugman concludes, the austerity agenda looks like a simple expression of upper class preferences wrapped in a facade of academic rigor. Upper class preferences. What the 1% wants becomes economic science. And that summarizes the way economics, policy, and thinking in general goes in society. That people's preferences, people's beliefs, are formed not on a rational basis but reflect their self-interests and the self-interests of the elite are not our interests, are not the interests of the middle class and the working class at all. And so there's belief systems coming from education, uh, from, uh, well, from all the sources that generate beliefs but primarily from education systems, sciences and so on that support these different points of views. Now what I'm trying to say here in a rambling way is first and foremost inequality exists in the economic system. Secondly, capitalism generates inequality and the past century seems to suggest and rather suggest quite strongly that capitalism promotes increasing disparity between the rich and the poor. It doesn't do that consistently. There are areas, small state areas, uh, typically northern European countries like Sweden, Scandinavian countries um, that have been able to reduce the disparity between the rich and the poor but those are exceptions to the rule. What we find is that capitalism produces inequality, capitalism produces suffering through its production of inequality and the universal recognition among economists, very few are willing to deny this, that capitalism produces inequality and that inequality is now one of the primary policy issues around the world because if you have high levels of inequality you have high levels of unrest and the elite for whatever else they want they don't want political unrest because political unrest interferes with the operations of corporations and corporations are the primary vehicle through which the elite make and maintain their wealth. So when we're looking at the political economy of media, we need to have a model of, first and foremost, the economic system. If we start with the wrong model, we're going to end up going off in a different direction. It's just like a map. A map, a model, same thing. If the map is wrong, you're going to end up in the wrong place. If the model is wrong, your thinking is going to be all wrong. And so the model, the correct model for capitalism, for modeling the economic system, is a model that says, the economic system produces inequality. It's also a model that demonstrates and suggests quite, quite firmly shows, I believe, that the elite control the policy-making process. This has been well established. The policies that direct spending, taxes, and so on 
uh, that whole process of policy making, I'm not going to go into the details now, but have been captured by, for quite some time, uh, the right wing in Britain, United States, Canada, and many other places around the world. The elite have superior capabilities of lobbying, of accessing policy makers, of picking up the telephone and talking to important people the way that we don't, for obvious reasons. And a result of that, through those processes and through elite right-wing funded think tanks, like the Fraser Institute and many others in the United States, is that policies for 30 years, 40 years or more, have been shifting to the right, have been shifting in favor of protecting elite interests. And as a result of that, the middle class, the earning power of the middle class, the uh, retirement security of the middle class, the health care system that the middle class benefits from, all of, these pros, all of these systems have been eroding as the elite capture policy making and ensure that policies are written that favor their needs over the needs of the, the many. So it's an extraordinary system when we're looking at capitalism. We're looking at something that promotes an unjust world, something that pretty well everyone recognizes as need of a fix. And if we ask what is the end result of the production system, capitalism is a, a production system, it produces goods, but the, also the other end result of this capitalist system is not just inequality, it is a destruction of the physical environment, which we're coming to to terms with, again, the right wing will deny this, but it's pretty obvious if you sniff the air or taste the water in any urban area anywhere around the world, the environment is a cesspool. Capitalism is a destructive force that undermines the environment, undermines our physical health, and creates inequality and, I believe, strife and dissension between, between groups as well. It's much better to divide and conquer than to create a system that brings us all together and sees us all has, as having similar interests, and, and quite the opposite is happening, and we'll come back to that when we look at uh, uh, various models of the new system, particularly those coming from uh, Noam, Noam Chomsky. Anyway, just a a few thoughts here, rambling as it were, sorry about that, but on the starting point for the study of the political economy of media is capitalism itself. What is it? What is the nature of this social system where we elevate billionaires to uh, the point where they are worshipped as as gurus, as, measure, as, as a measure of success and value, and not as, as robber barons that they usually are? What is it about the nature of this, this economic system that molds the thinking of the middle class to believe that capitalism and democracy represents their choices and their best interests. This is an ideological process where the values that we have align to the needs of corporations. We end up producing citizens, citizens that believe and behave in ways that uh, reproduce the system. The, the idea here, the concept here is that, is that in a mass society you need the distribution, the production and distribution of mass ideas that allow for mass behavior that aligns to the needs of mass society. And one of the primary systems for producing compliant citizens who believe that the ruling elite, that the economic system and that democracy itself are working in the interests of everyone equally in a reasonably uh, efficient fashion. To produce that, you need mass education. And university and high school, and university in particular, is one of the most ideological systems where we find the production and reproduction of ideas because that support the the uh, managerial processes of capitalism because one of the primary goals, one of the primary products of the university system is the management class itself. 
out of universities come the not just the workers but the managers and for some of you the owners and operators of capitalism we are the management class and universities are intent first and foremost on producing a friction-free population that aligns with the needs of the state and corporations so that capitalism continues to roll on uninterrupted but we're going to look at it from another perspective here we're going to look at capitalism excuse me as a belief system that has been captured by the elite that uh, creates the conditions of class warfare uh, and how media becomes the mouthpiece of corporations and the political elite and a primary vehicle for manipulating public opinion and when it's not ma manipulating public opinion it's just distracting us with bread and circuses. Some of the things we'll be looking at over the next six weeks. Thank you for coming. Thank you Professor Ray St. Jacques for assisting today and I think that will be enough for now and I'll see you all next class. For next class, I want everyone to have read their introduction and we're going to do another series of informal presentations on your introductory chapter. So that's your homework. Read the introductions to your books and be ready to present an informal, no PowerPoint or anything like that. I just want you to stand up, give an informal summary of your introductions to the class. What we'll accomplish through this reading seminar is instead of looking at one book and instead of me going blah 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 for three hours twice a week, which would be very painful, is that we will spread the work out amongst all of us and we will go from one book to many books and we'll cover much more ground and move much farther faster and have a little more entertaining value as well from all the different perspectives and personalities and you're going to do fine and uh, if this course goes anything like it has gone in the past we're going to have a great time looking at some what I find to be some very interesting and often exciting ideas about the operation of power in modern society because in the end that's what we're looking at is when we're looking at how power operates in and through media systems in a media culture where people spend more time consuming media than they spend doing anything else at all thank you again see you next week remember introduction read it be prepared to talk about it